Hello everyone, welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. This is episode number 26, and we are going federal. So we've got Stephen Woodworth, Conservative Party of Canada candidate for Kitchener Centre. He showed up at my front door, full disclaimer, that's how we got him on the show. You'll hear about that uh, at the very beginning of this first episode. However, before we get into our discussion with Stephen, I should mention that we have our official first sponsor. Now, am I the president of the particular group that is sponsoring us? Maybe, but as you know on our show, we're all about the shameless plugs. So, Ignite Volleyball Club in Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge, and Guelph, and all surrounding areas, Uh, has their youth programs starting up in September. So make sure you visit the website, ignitevolleyball.ca. We've got programs for ages 4 to 12 right now. Yes, we do start volleyball at the age of 4. And uh, like I said, all programs start very shortly. Visit the website. We've got Ignite Sparks, Ignite Fire, Ignite Magic. All the age groups, lots of fun, not high competitiveness at all. Uh, if you have never played before, a great program for your kid to start. Again, ignitevolleyball.ca. On to the show with Stephen. We talked about some really cool topics. Respectful disagreement. Neat term. Uh, one thing we talked about was around negativity and people these days now hate people that disagree with you. So things have changed. On the topic of things changing, how has campaigning changed over the years? It's very, very different with social media, mass media, uh, housing can't have an interview with the federal guy without talking about housing mortgage rules this new 10 percent federal loan program let's talk about his thoughts uh we get his opinion on multiple offers with new properties and then of course we close off the first episode uh part one of two with the economy the u.s free trade and why this has kind of become a good news bad news story for canadians without further ado here's steven Welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. Finance, life, business, and everything in between. And now, your host, Stephen Green. Welcome, everyone, to the Green Effect Podcast. We are episode number 25, and I'm pleased to welcome Stephen Woodworth, Conservative Party of Canada candidate for Kitchener Centre. He's a farm member of Parliament. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much for inviting me. No problem. And you, I mean, listen, I had to invite you because you've got a great name. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's one of those names where it's it's unique, it's special. So I had to have you on. You're the first other Stephen to be on the show. So just to let you know. It's an honor. Absolutely. Thank you. I haven't had that yet either. So that's good. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get right into it. Um, your path and business career. Tell me how you got to this point. Sure. I was one of the very... Uh, fortunate people who knew at an early age what my life work would be. So when I was 17, I decided that I really should uh, do something politically and try to uh, lead uh, from the values that I knew. Uh, And at that time, I was a very shy young man. I knew I needed some training and some practice. So I felt that going to law school would be the best training I could get. It would teach me about the laws that politicians should be developing and enforcing and administering. I went to law school, I uh, got my law degree, uh, and then uh, the uh, funny thing was that I spent uh, 30 years in training because uh, I practiced law for 30 years before I ultimately got elected to parliament in 2008. Along the way I did have some political experience in uh, being elected to the one of the local school boards for nine years, mm-hmm. and uh, that was also excellent training on uh, the ins and outs of politics. So I've been at this now for uh, 45 years, uh, politically one way or the other. The first campaign I ever uh, functioned in was in 1972, and I dropped flyers for the conservative candidate in Kitchener, Barney Lawrence, another lawyer. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, since that time, I've held every possible political job uh, except uh, maybe uh, some of the get-out-the-vote uh, work. Even that I did in my last campaign. So 
I, um, I feel I've got a good grasp of what's required. We've got quite a few lawyers that are into politics and stuff like that. It's almost like something where you, you end up at some point when you're a lawyer. But, I mean, it, it's so, it, when you're a lawyer, you've got that great well, background, you, right? You, you want to know something funny that uh, lawyers and politicians have in common, and that is that people love to make jokes about them, but as soon as there's a problem... Who are the first ones that uh, people run to for solutions? Lawyers and politicians. Absolutely. The reality is, actually, Stephen, that the uh, parliament needs more lawyers because lawyers are trained in the art of respectful disagreement. And in, in, our, in our country today, uh, the idea of respectful disagreement has fallen into disuse. Mm -hmm. You need to have people who can actually debate issues without becoming enemies. And that's what uh, lawyers do for their bread and butter. So I sometimes wish we had more lawyers in Parliament for that reason alone. Never thought of it that way, actually. That's a really good way to look at it. And, and you're absolutely correct, right? Yeah. Uh, we go very different directions with this stuff. So um, so question about campaigning. Now, one part I left out in our usual podcast uh, uh, sequence here is how did we meet? But we met through yourself campaigning. So right. you knocked on my door and... Um, I love the blue shoes, right? We had the blue shirt, the blue shoes. I'm like, awesome. I love it. And um, it was funny because you, you knocked on my door and, uh, you know, you're talking about the campaign and stuff like that. And I said, well, I said, if you're looking at a campaign, I got this little show thing that I do. And, and that's how we met. So I was happy that we did. Yeah. So how has campaigning changed for you? I mean, you've been in this a long time and we've got millennials who I have two kids, 16 and 18. Uh, they will not go off their phones. How has campaigning changed over the years? Yeah, they're, they're, uh, the basic uh, operation remains the same, and that is somehow you have to connect with people, but the means of connecting are becoming uh, more and more tenuous. Uh, when I was in university many years ago, the political science theory said that the local candidate could influence between seven and nine percent of the electorate uh, to vote one way or the other. Probably with the advent of uh, not only social media but much more heavily invested mass media, that percentage has shrunk and the local candidate has less of an effect. People are focused on national leaders, national parties, national issues. Sometimes uh, they don't even know who the local candidate is. And so uh, it's our job as candidates to try to overcome that. And it is the same challenge as it always has been, and that is meeting people. Mm -hmm. uh, mass media today are becoming very fragmented. You look at what's happened to our local newspapers and television stations, and the readership and the viewership is down. People get their uh, information from other sources. People filter their information according to their own likes and dislikes. So it's a little harder to break through those uh, partisan barriers than it used to be. Uh, the solution is a lot of door knocking. It's uh, attending on an event like this and uh, letting people hear you in your own words uh, through this kind of media. It's a question of going out into the community, going to places where people are and meeting them. And that's still old fashioned politics. It's also truthful to say that opinion leaders still make a big difference. They're now in social media referred to as influencers, mm -hmm. uh, but when I was going to school, they were called opinion leaders. And so you, you would like to be able to aggregate your contacts with opinion leaders because they will then go out and express their opinions to those that they influence, and in that way your impact is uh, magnified. Mm -hmm. I want to say, though, that the other issue is the negativity. I referred to that a moment ago when I was talking about lawyers in Parliament. But goodness, the, the last federal election was the nastiest, most hateful campaign that I've ever participated in, and I've participated in campaigns for 45 years. The idea that you have to hate the people that disagree with you is becoming more and more prevalent. And it's bad for democracy. You cannot run a democracy when you hate the people that disagree with you or that you disagree with. You have to be able to respect them and accept them and live with the results if they are successful and you are not. They and basically not take it personal, almost. That's right. It gets like that, right? Correct. Uh, my, my rule is that 
I try very hard never to criticize the personality or the motives of those who oppose me, but only to criticize their policies and their actions and their conduct. We can separate out what people do from who people are. If I could change any one thing in our current political environment, that would be it. Yeah, you know what, and, and you're right that that's almost that's almost good business to to not say take things personal again paraphrasing what you're saying a little bit um, and that's tough with, with social media and how quick it is for me to go on to Facebook Instagram whatever and say wow what a jerk that guy was exactly. and, and there's no repercussion I'm allowed to do it and it, people don't understand uh, that impact and I've learned that that's something I had to learn as well right yeah. obviously being in business and stuff like that so not only does it destroy our hope of maintaining democracy because it creates almost uh, armed factions or, or semi-armed factions, but, but it also results in very poor policy because it's fundamentally illogical. If, you, if, you, if anybody has taken any uh, basic logic uh, courses, they know that the ad hominem fallacy uh, is, uh, is stupid. Uh, the idea that because somebody has a, a bad idea, uh, they are um, a, a stupid person just isn't right. We all have bad moments here and then. And, but oddly enough, the converse is also true. The fact that somebody has a good idea doesn't make them a good person yeah. or a smart person. So you have to try to f narrow your focus to what the ideas are and, and try to avoid commenting on the personalities of uh, and the motives of others. Uh, the ideas are what will outlive them. Anyway, I talk myself and write myself blue in the face on social media on that, and I don't have many converts, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's no, okay, though, but you know what? It's true. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. It's, it's an absolutely true point. So, uh, housing. Let's talk about the hot-button topic of the last five, six years. So, uh, mortgage rules changing they're getting tighter. Uh, so two things I want to talk to you about this, the mortgage rules, uh, what's coming down the pipe and, and, and what you see. And then of course this new uh, 10%, we're going to call it a loan. That's what it is from the liberals. So first of all, let's talk about mortgage rules. What do you see coming? What are you hearing? Um, obviously I'm in the mortgage world. Uh, I'm hearing all sorts of different things. Tell me more about what you're seeing. Well, I think that when it comes to mortgages, you're, the government walks a tightrope. On the one hand, uh, you want to maintain a, a healthy and robust uh, real estate market and one that uh, does uh, create a supply of housing for people, uh, and you need a certain amount of demand to drive that, uh, and you want, uh, you want people to be able to fulfill their dream of owning their own home. It's a good investment. There's a lot of positives about it. On the other side of that tightrope, though, is the the chasm that you can fall into where you allow people to borrow more than they can afford to borrow. And we saw what happened in the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States uh, that led to the recession in 2008, 10 years ago. Ultimately, the bill comes due and people can't pay it, and then everybody hurts. It's a bad uh, domino game. Exactly. It, it rippled out and eventually had the ironic result of uh, lending, lenders freezing up. Then they, they started retracting loans and, and credit that had been given to business people for years, and businesses started to fail, and so on it went. So, so the government wants to avoid falling into the trap of encouraging people to borrow more than they are capable of uh, handling. Uh, so actually, before this 10% uh, new idea came along from the Liberals, uh, we were walking that tightrope fairly well. We were um, just ensuring that the rules didn't permit people to borrow beyond their means. Uh, but this 10% uh, new lending rule has totally upset that apple cart, and in a very deceptive way. The Liberals are now actually have come up with a way that people can borrow more without actually feeling the pain. They don't have to make monthly payments. They don't have to worry about the interest rate now. Uh, they can borrow that extra 10% and not worry about it in the short term. And, and the reason that's deceptive is because the bill will come due. Uh, and in fact, even 
in a worse way than the ordinary loan because the liberals are calling this a, an equity investment on the part of the government. And, and to a lawyer, at least, or anyone involved in real estate law, that means that the government is thinking about taking a stake in your house. And if the value goes up, then that 10% uh, that, that uh, you borrowed uh, will uh, also, uh, the value of that will increase, and you will end up paying the government back uh, perhaps much more than you borrowed plus what you would have paid in interest. But all of that said, the real problem with it is that it allows people to borrow uh, easy money uh, more. Uh, and as you may know, uh, already the household uh, consumer debt rate in Canada is something like 1.78% yeah. of the annual uh, average, in, average annual income. And I'm told, although I haven't verified this yet, I'm told that Canada is among the highest uh, of those ratios in the world. Uh, and so the government really shouldn't be uh, uh, giving people ways to uh, borrow easy money more. Mm -hmm. I understand they're pandering to voters in an election year, but that's a very, very irresponsible thing to do in these circumstances, in, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know uh, what will happen if we form a conservative government. Uh, I don't think that the Conservative Party has taken a, a position on that, but uh, I really hope that it'll be grandfathered out because I don't like it when governments fool people and deceive them, and that's what this is. It's not, it's not free money, mm -hmm. and it, it's not easy money. It's going to have to be repaid, whether it's when you sell or when you remortgage. I don't know yet what the trigger will be, yeah. uh, but well, it's deceptive. Well, and I think, too, it's... and, and uh, I'm for any program that helps Canadian first-time home buyers. It is the Canadian dream. Own your own home, the white picket fence, the whole bit. Uh, that, that ratio to debt, the, the debt ratio that, that um, you mentioned, I remember 10, 15 years ago, they were saying if we get to 161, it's Armageddon. We got a problem. Hmm. We're at 178, and you're right. We are, we're just so far beyond that. It's, it's not good. So adding, adding debt to a household that has already got too much is a concern. Having said that, though, what is the answer to get first-time homebuyers in which income has not caught up with the price of real estate? How do we get them into these homes if that's not the answer? Well, you've mentioned the magic word, which is price or pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as you know, I'm sure from your business experience, pricing is determined by supply and demand. And there are two ways that you can affect pricing that is short of the kind of uh, draconian uh, wage and price controls that the Liberals have previously uh, um, experimented with in the 1970s. The, the two legitimate ways that a government can influence uh, pricing are, are by influencing uh, demand or uh, supply. So actually what the government is doing with this 10% rule is they're stimulating demand. Now if you stimulate demand sure. without, without also uh, providing uh, supply to match, uh, then what you're actually doing is driving up the price, pricing. Uh, the government has a little bit of, uh, has some programming to stimulate uh, supply, uh, in uh, rental housing at least, uh, and, and that's a good thing. But I think what we need to do is really focus more on if we're really concerned about allowing Canadians to buy homes at reasonable prices, we have to do more to stimulate the supply than to stimulate the demand. Stimulating the demand is not going to help that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we uh, stimulate the supply? One, one idea that I was um, sort of over several years uh, investigating when I was a member of parliament and became more and more enthusiastic about was that, for example, we could allow um, developers of multiple residential units to defer the uh, taxation of capital gain 
when they dispose of a multiple residential unit, providing that they invest the proceeds of that disposal into new multiple residential units. Okay, I see where you're going. So, yeah. so right now, if you own a, um, a multiple uh, unit uh, apartment building and you sell it, you will realize capital gains on it. You will be taxed immediately on that. Mm -hmm. You will, therefore, be unable to invest all of the proceeds into new uh, and upgraded uh, or newly built uh, multiple residential units. So this simple proposal would allow uh, people in that situation uh, to invest 100% of the proceeds and defer the taxation until the ultimate sale without reinvestment. Mm -hmm. That would increase the supply of multiple unit uh, residences. Now, I have to confess one small thing here because I'm a cautious guy. The last time I looked at that was when I was in Parliament in 2015, and at that time, uh, even the government that I was supporting was resisting that idea, and I was trying to push them toward it. I haven't heard that the uh, subsequent government did anything to change that. If they haven't, I didn't hear, I apologize, but I don't think they have. So I'd like to resume that uh, push if and when I return to Parliament. Yeah, and I think that would be a, that's definitely one way to stimulate, you know, that, that supply. supply. Yeah, I think it's, because uh, I think most of those, so I deal quite a bit with investors, um, people purchasing investment properties, multi-residential, stuff like that. And I think that's, once you get the bug, you want to keep going because it, it can be very lucrative if you're doing it right and investing properly. So so along those lines then, and this is a perfect segue into into another question, if we keep going the way we're going and um, the demand goes up and there's just not the supply, right now, and it hasn't stopped, it's now become the way of doing business as opposed to uh, the exception, these multiple offers, you know, these, um, the way offers are done right now, uh, people just buy things firm. And, and you know, we, as, as, as institutions, we can't say, yeah, go firm because we don't know what you're going to buy. But is there any talk about regulating the real estate world so that you can say, look, if we're truly going to protect buyers, first time home buyers in particular, if we're going to protect you, the offer must have a condition. It must have financing. It must have inspection. Just it's almost like trying to protect them from from themselves, right? Is there any talk around that? Well, the issue that you're raising has a lot of different implications. So let me try and uh, quickly sort through some of them. For, first of all, uh, the government of Canada, which is the um, place that I aspire to go as a legislator. Mm -hmm. Uh, doesn't have jurisdiction over property and civil rights, so that our involvement with uh, the uh, real estate business is limited only to federal issues like money laundering, for example. And by the way, there's some s serious problems that the federal government has created <laughs> in the regulatory requirements that have been imposed on realtors in relation to money laundering. Um, but. Uh, the Government of Canada doesn't regulate, for example, consumer protection on um, um, anything but n national uh, national scales, not, certainly not on real estate purchases and sales, um, nor does it regulate contract uh, law generally. So these are issues that I know it sounds like a put-off, but uh, these are issues which ultimately will be determined by the government of Ontario in our province, not by the government of Canada. Uh, and, and when they do, though, uh, you have to remember that we have a tradition of common law, which is to say that we don't uh, have decrees from on high telling people what they can or cannot do. I'd, I'd be okay with that on this topic, yeah. just so you Well, know. Uh, unless it's a very clear case, okay? Yeah. And I know you might be okay with it, but, but the problem is you sometimes have to stop and remember that if you start to legitimize decrees from on high about this, that, and the next thing, then pretty soon it's also A, B, C, D, and E yeah. uh, in addition to the things that you want done. We like to think that people are advised by... Uh, competent uh, professionals, and for the most part they are, about how to protect their interests. Uh, what really you're pointing out 
is the imbalance in bargaining position between buyers and sellers in a hot market. Uh, right now, it's a seller's market. Uh, the demand is, um, is uh, limited. And so the buyers don't have as much bargaining power to, uh, to uh, protect themselves the way that they might like to. Uh, and uh, again, that goes back to our earlier problem of, or our earlier discussion about how do you stimulate supply uh, in order to level that off. Uh, whether the solution is to start decreeing that uh, people must do this or that in their relations with each other or not, uh, it's a case-by-case -case situation. You know, uh, for example, uh, house inspections. Um, we got along pretty well for years and years, I know, as a lawyer, uh, before house inspections sort of became the norm. And there were occasional problems, uh, but it didn't raise a great human cry. So has anything changed? Well, I don't know. Um, uh, are house inspections necessary? Well, in the vast majority of cases, still probably not necessary. But in those exceptional cases where there might be a problem, then they're a big help. So uh, what, uh, at what point does government step in and say, well, there is a 1 in 25 risk that someone might be damaged, therefore we should regulate that uh, and require everybody to pay for home inspections? How do you weigh that off? Uh, it's, it's a case-by-case -case analysis, and again, it's not a provincial, I'm sorry, it is a provincial issue, not a federal issue, so I can't comment too f much about it. Yeah, and fair enough, and I, I think... Uh Home inspections, you're right, there's a cost associated with that. And I look at uh, financing, there's no cost associated with that. Correct. And I think, uh, so, and I might I might get this wrong with who's what, but I mean, there is a CREA, so Canadian Real Estate Association. And of course, I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's more of a federal issue because of Vancouver. Ontario's got the issue. Um, some of the other provinces, it, it's starting to maybe become one. I mean, obviously the... The um, uh, the prairies are the exact opposite, but uh, I'm thinking if it's if it is financing and if it is that sort of thing, is there an opportunity to say, okay, you just got to make sure you have five days on the financing thing? And again, it, can it be a Canadian real estate association thing as opposed to provincial? But you're saying it's more of a provincial thing. Well, than even anything. even though there is a Canadian real estate association, I think that they uh, the the legal jurisdiction for contract law remains provincial, mm, and okay. the Canadian real estate association has to deal with the law as it applies. And now the the government of Canada has sometimes tried to create a kind of advisory uniform standards approach where you can strike a, a commission or, or a body uh, and you can do a study and you can and you can develop best practices and you can recommend them to provinces but ultimately the legislative authority constitutional authority is still provincial I, I think though that one would have to take your point um, and examine it a little more closely. I don't know whether we would have the time, but whose risk is it if a purchaser submits an offer that is that has no condition on financing? In a way, it's the seller's risk too, because what's going to happen is that the seller is going to enter into that agreement and then they're going to find out that it falls through uh, and uh, they're going to be behind in their program of selling and then they're trying to buy something and they don't have to, yeah. Uh, precisely. So yeah. it's, a, it's in a way that particular issue is kind of a mutual uh, risk of the seller and the uh, purchaser. Um, and, uh, and so they have professionals to advise them about whether or not they should accept such a risk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not saying I would oppose it if I was a provincial legislature, that I would oppose um, some rule that says you c you cannot submit an offer without having your financing in place. You can't submit a final offer. And then I guess you'd have to punish people who did try to submit an offer without having their, you know. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying Sl I would... Slippery slope, eh? Yeah, slippery I wouldn't slope. oppose it. 
uh, but but I'd want to study it a little more, and it wouldn't be in my jurisdiction. So I'm afraid I have to kind of leave it. That's at that. the lawyer in you. I can hear it. <laughs> well, I, it's not just me as a <laughs> but lawyer, it's true. but it's a, it's me as a cautious, cautious legislator yeah. saying that I can't take a position on something. Uh, like that until I've examined the issue from all sides. And, and, and you know, maybe that's another reason why lawyers make good legislators. Uh, I, a guy who, or a woman who comes in and says, oh, yeah, sure, I'll go along with that without thinking about it, doesn't make a good legislator. That's true. That's true. And you know what? That's why you're the lawyer, and I'm just I'm the guy over here saying, let's change it, please, help, help, help. But, yeah, I understand what you're saying totally. Okay. So, okay, so uh, as the U.S. goes, we go, Okay. What do you think about all the stuff with um, our good friend Trump, uh, the stuff going on with trade wars? How does it impact you know, people here in, in, in Kitchener as well? Like, wh- What are your thoughts on some of that? Well, uh, I, um, years ago, was not a big fan of entering into a limited specific trade agreement with the United States that later became NAFTA. As it turned out, I was uh, a little bit proven wrong by history on that because NAFTA turned out to be pretty good for Canada, mainly on account of the imbalance in the value of the dollar. Uh, However, that said, uh, I have certainly become convinced that global free trade is a good thing for Canada. One in five Canadian jobs is associated with an export industry. And when Canada can export, uh, we gain employment and we become wealthier overall. So like most people in the Conservative Party of Canada, I am uh, in favor of global free trade. I am in favor of reducing tariff and non-tariff barriers. Uh, I'm glad that, in fact, the uh, previous government, uh, previous conservative government, went around the world and expanded the number of markets into which Canada could trade freely without tariff barriers. And I'm distressed that the uh, Trump government seems to be taking a different approach and seems to be aggressively uh, engaging in trade wars with uh, uh, China, for example. And they, there may be good reasons for that from an American perspective. I'm not going to try and second guess the American president about American policy, but by and large, I would prefer to see a world where there were no tariff or non-tariff trade barriers, uh, and I think that uh, rising tide would carry all ships. Again, we've seen mixed results for Canadians over the American trade war with China. Uh, We have two Canadians who are currently in prison and may lose their lives because China is retaliating against us uh, because uh, the Americans have uh, asked uh, to extradite a, a Chinese citizen from Canada. It's all wrapped up in the trade dispute between the Chinese and the Americans. We have canola farmers and others whose products have been banned from China, uh, undoubtedly as retribution for the, the same uh, constellation of issues. So Canada is suffering because of that. Um, we, there's a few small bright points. I read, for example, the other day that Christie Digital, which is a local company in Kitchener in my riding, although albeit owned by a German company, is now going to transfer some of its production away from China into Kitchener Excellent. because of Trump's trade barriers against China. They want to consolidate their North American production to ensure that it's protected against Trump's trade barriers against China. So actually, Kitchener, my writing, will benefit in a small way from those trade barriers that Trump is erecting against China. That's all, fantastic yeah, news. It is. It is. It's a small glimmer of uh, good news. And, but, but overall, uh, my assessment is that we would be better off without trade wars and without tariff barriers. And so I'm not uh, too happy with it. By so, the so way... Let me throw this at you for a yes. sec. I just thought of this. So if I can put two and two together, part of the reason why I think Trump is doing this is because he wants the jobs in America. He wants the, everything to be in the U.S., 
by Christie doing that, is that not kind of Donald Trump, his whole thought working? It is. That's yeah. correct. Except, of course, that uh, they're doing it in Canada by virtue of NAFTA, and yeah. that's okay for and us. And of course, because we're so linked to the U.S., but, right? Like but you're would, quite correct. That's yeah. exactly why Donald Trump is doing it. And in that res- in that one case, it worked. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of other downsides to tariffs. You know, uh, American consumers will pay more, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, so will Canadian consumers. Uh, uh, so, but. But in, in any event, what, what is striking about the whole situation is that the current government, the Trudeau government, has sat on its hands, has twiddled its thumbs, and hasn't even appointed a new ambassador to China to give Canada its strongest voice. It's almost unbelievable that in the middle of all this, with Canadian lives at stake in China, that the Trudeau government hasn't appointed uh, an ambassador to China to replace John McCallum, uh, who was dismissed uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, but mainly because uh, he was speaking out of turn, uh, I don't know how many months ago. The first thing on their agenda should have been to appoint an ambassador to take charge of the uh, Canadian representation in Beijing and to be a a voice to the uh, Chinese government which could articulate our our concerns. And they haven't done that. Yeah, that's that's an important post. That's yeah. important. Right now, that's really critical. It's critical, and lives are at stake, in fact. And it's, it's, it's inexplicable why the Trudeau government has uh, twiddled its sums. What's the, what's the reason? Uh, they haven't expressed a reason. Hmm. Uh, and uh, they haven't, uh, uh, you know, the media hasn't called them to account, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, which is a s- sad but uh, common tale. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, um, I didn't know that. You know, I, I think that uh, the, the first thing that I hope uh, a new government, uh, a new conservative government would do is to appoint a strong ambassador uh, for Canada to China to begin to exert our positions in a coherent way with the government of China. Well, and, and like I said, as they go, we go. And so you're right. I think we need someone there who understands the process, knows what's going on, and, and just can kind of get their hat, you know, throw their hat in the ring and make sure that they're in finding out what's, what's the being discussion. said. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Yeah, that, that's pretty, pretty important. So. And there you go, part one of two of having our first federal guest on, Stephen Woodworth. So uh, stay tuned, episode two is going to be coming up. We're going to be talking about CRA accountability, popular topic, income splitting. Why was it eliminated? And a thought that I had on income splitting in general. And then we're going to talk about deficits. Um, We're focused on it. What about actually reducing the national debt? Deficit's one thing, but can we just get a little closer to getting out of debt? That's our next one, part two. And until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Green Effect Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Google Play so you catch the next episode. And don't forget to leave a review. Much appreciated.